Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andrea Ostheimer, the representative of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here at the United Nations in New York. And I'm extending a warm welcome to you to today's presentation of a study undertaken in cooperation with IOE and addressing human rights, due diligence, supply chain law, what business needs to know. For those of you who need interpretation, you will find at the bottom of the Zoom bar uh, the buttons for Spanish and French. So please feel free to make use of it. And we will also provide you in the, the chat box, the link to the publication, to the study. So if you would like to dig deeper into the topic, please also access the study. The study as such forms part of our cooperation with the International Organization of Employers in which we aim to strengthen the role of the private sector in the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And we do this at a time when awareness amongst key stakeholders grows that SDGs cannot be achieved through mere intergovernmental cooperation. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres likes to phrase it, all hands on deck are needed now. And we need, for example, the input of the private sector to ensure that SDG 4 education also meets the needs of rapidly changing labor markets. The role of the private sector in developing and using renewable energies is crucial to SDG 7. Private sector responsibilities for SDG 8, decent work and growth are evident. But so is the adherence and promotion of SDG 16, the private sector needs and benefits from effective and accountable state institutions and the access to an independent judiciary. So the topic of today's discussion, human rights, due diligence and supply chain law is grounded on the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. The work and brainchild of John Ruge, former UN special rapporteur on business and human rights and assistant secretary general, who just passed away a few days ago. It has been his strive to seek that business activities are not only financially sustainable, but also become part of the solution to address the manifold global challenges and that they are anchored in international human rights norms and standards. It is quite encouraging to see that since the UN guiding principles and business and human rights have been passed in June 2011, not only have companies adhered to them voluntarily, also states have acknowledged the need to move beyond the voluntary commitment of companies in order to level the playing field to set equal standards and to prevent companies from shedding their responsibility for the sake of profits and to the harm of people and the environment. However, the nature of the topic is highly complex. The set of due diligence standards and norms differs not only amongst nation states, but also like in the US among states on federal level. For companies and particularly medium-sized companies who might operate aid in multiple countries, but still cannot afford large legal departments, the challenges are manifold. Therefore, and before I'm handing over to the Deputy Secretary General of IOE, Matthias Thorns, I specifically would like to say for sharing their thoughts on these complexities and to raise attention in today's discussion to the specific challenges which still need to be addressed by policymakers nationally as well as globally. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Please post your questions into the Q&A box as early as possible so the moderator can weave them into the discussion. I'm wishing you interesting insights and I'm handing over to Matthias now. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you so for supporting this joint work on due diligence and what employers need to know. Um, in Europe alone, in the last three, uh, nine months, three countries adopted due diligence laws, Switzerland, Germany, and Norway. And then at the end of October, the European Commission most likely will present its proposal for its supply chain directive. So it's a very dynamic process we see. And this process is not only affecting companies in Europe, but around the world. Because a company who is covered by such an obligation will of course um, make sure that the due diligence is strong. They will, might require from their own suppliers that they engage in due diligence. They might ask for more transparency. They might leave certain regions because it is too risky to be in this region. 
So the impact of these laws go far beyond um, Europe, far beyond individual countries, but it is affecting the business community around. And that's the reason why we're very happy and proud to have representative of business from all parts of the world in this discussion today with us. As Andrea has said, we have prepared a paper on this to support employers how to deal with these developments. So what we are doing is we are looking into questions linked, what are the UN guiding principles say on due diligence? What are recent de uh, legal developments, judicial developments? What are the expectations of stakeholders? What is the UN actually, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the UN Working Group saying on um, due diligence? And what is critical to know about these different laws? Because at the end of the day, law is not equal law. Just look at the scope. Norway, in the Norwegian law, companies are covered which have 50 employees and more. In Switzerland, it's 500 employees. And in Germany, it is 3,000 um, from next year and then 1,000 from a year later. So you can see already huge differences here. Look at the issue about liability. In the German law, it clearly says there is no supply chain liability foreseen. Whereas in the Wolters report, which was adopted by the European Parliament and where many expect it will influence the Commission proposal, a supply chain liability is foreseen. And these are only two examples where the business community, the employees community, have to have a clear understanding so they can better engage in these processes. Because it makes a huge difference when it comes about the implementation. What we will have at the beginning is a presentation by um, Tom Player, who comes from the IE partner company Evershed, on the different legal developments. And then we quickly go into a panel to get different impressions what these legal developments mean for business in the different regions. And I will um, introduce the panelists um, when I give the word to them. We then have a presentation by the UN, by UNDP, how the UN can help companies actually in their due diligence. And then finally, we will have a closing round of whatever questions are still open. So without losing time, Tom, Tom over to you to give us an overview about the different legal developments. I think you have a presentation, so you can share your screen. Or Monique is sharing the screen. Perfect. Over to you. Fantastic. Thank, thanks, Matthias. Um, um, good afternoon to everybody, or good morning, wherever you may be joining from. It's a pleasure to be here today. I have the unenviable task of trying to give you a legal overview of an ever emerging landscape um, in 15 minutes or so. Um, just before we, I take you through that slide, a couple of um, opening thoughts from me. Um, it's apparent that the global labour practices are coming under increasing scrutiny. Um, the pressure is growing on business and business does need to be cognizant of that. It's obviously 10 years since the UNGPs have published. As Matthias has said, we're moving from a voluntary set of principles and soft law to ever evolving hard law in this area, um, often with extraterritorial uh, effect. So there's a big shift underway to mandatory human rights due diligence and companies that choose not to engage in this process or to engage with it properly are increasingly running at greater risks, uh, not only in terms of emerging financial penalties, um, depending upon the legislation, but significant damage to corporate reputations, impacts on their sales, share value, customer and investor backlash. Um, what is hugely encouraging is that the UNGPs in particular, uh, which were the um, tremendous work of the late John Ruggie, his contribution in this area has been hugely significant. It's made companies step up and take notice of the human rights. But I think many people on this call and the panel would probably acknowledge that the pace of change has perhaps not been as quick as some would like. Um, the human rights impacts um, that are still evident in supply chains, um, uh, governments around the world and the EU uh, have decided that now is the time to uh, move on from this position and to start bringing and introducing a range of different laws. Um, and the, 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 these laws, so we, we already have uh, some legislation on the statute book. Um, uh, legislation is on the statute book in some cases, but, but not yet implemented. Um, so uh, we have uh, 
legislation uh, on slavery and trafficking in the US and the UK in the form of the Modern Slavery Act and the Californian and Transparency and Supply Chain Act and the new French Vigilance Law. Uh, we've got legislation that's been passed now in Germany, which will come into effect on a tiered basis, depending upon the size of the company, and the same for Norway. And the Netherlands have passed so far limited legislation dealing with uh, child labour, but they're due to publish an, a revised national action plan later this year. So we, we have um, uh, 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 new campaigns going on. Um, and potential proposed legislation in other jurisdictions and some uh, continuing involving uh, an involving scene. Broadly, what is this legislation doing? Because I don't have time today to go into the different facets of the legislation, although I will pull out some examples. Broadly, it requires organisations to adopt due diligence strategies by proactively identifying and managing and reporting on human rights risks across their global business and their relationships often as supply and value chains. Some provide requirements to provide remedy for harm if causing or contributing, and they echo the UNGPs. Others propose amending laws on direct duty liabilities, and some of the legislation builds on conflict minerals legislation. But um, if we could move to the next slide, please. The, the, but there are different legislative approaches emerging, and I think the incumbent thing upon businesses and corporations is to look at their geographical reach and look at where they are doing business and to be aware that there is no one set of clear guidelines and principles emerging, that they, they may need to be cognizant and aware of different legislation emerging in different jurisdictions. And I can see a situation where companies will have to begin adopting the highest standards where they're operating across international boundaries. So the regimes vary greatly in terms of the specific legal obligations imposed, the scope of their coverage, and the monitoring and enforcement. It also varies from sectors in certain legislation, and the themes and the risks that are targeted are often different as well. So in some cases, we have a requirement to prevent harm through the exercise of human rights due diligence, and the French law would be a good example of that. In, in other cases, we have uh, German laws, uh, uh, which were requirement to carry out human rights due diligence. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on the German and French laws, because these are uh, really, I think, uh, the laws which the EU will have most regard to when formulate, formulating and finalising the directive in due course. They're, they're the most stringent requirements that bin businesses are facing. The UK Modern Slavery Act was six years ago. The UK government have not yet caught up with the, the, the broader human rights obligations that are evident in, in, in France and Germany. Um, and, and in other cases, um, there's no explicit requirement to carry out human rights due diligence, and the Modern Slavery Act would be a good example of that, but strong incentives in that direction. What I would say is there's still clearly a, an obligation to report um, in certain cases and reporting still has a vital component role to it um, in terms of reputational and compliance from a commercial standpoint and as part of a corporate's overall ESG agenda. Um, reporting is going to be increasingly important around procurement and securing work through public contracts. Um, if we could move to the next slide, please. So these differing approaches, um, uh, let, let's try and give you a few themes from it. So in, in particular, there's differing approaches to the scope of human rights, which are protected. So under the French law, as an example, uh, that it protects serious violations of human rights, fundamental freedoms and health and safety. The UK Modern Slavery Act is confined to sl slavery and trafficking and forced labor. Norway, references basic human rights and decent working conditions, and the German law covers all human rights. So depending upon which jurisdiction you're faced with, understanding the scope of human rights which are protected is, is important. The existing laws generally do not distinguish between different types of human rights violations or the, on their severity or, or incorporate additional standards for particularly vulnerable groups of persons. 
only the French law specifically mentions severe violations. So just, just talking about the French law specifically as an example of a, of a high standard. Um, so it, as I've said, it covers serious violations of human rights, uh, fundamental freedoms, health and safety, applies to companies at the moment with 5,000 plus employees, but also international companies uh, with 10,000 plus, uh, 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 10, plus employees, but it's the specific requirements for a vigilance plan that's interesting. A, a, a specific reference to risk analysis, procedures providing for regular risk assessment on these human rights uh, issues, actions to mitigate risks, so specific obligations there, the requirement for a whistleblowing facility, uh, increasingly important in this area of law, and monitoring and evaluation of actions taken. And the scope of the duty is very broad. Um, and, and that's another thing to watch out for with this legislation. In, in many cases, it covers not just the parent company, but its subsidiaries. And there's a requirement to look at value chains and supply chains beyond first tier in some cases as well. So um, uh, in terms of the, the German legislation, again, very interesting. Uh, the, uh, from 2023, it'll apply to companies of 3000 plus but by 2024, only a couple of years away, a uh, thousand employees. So this is going to have a huge impact, and will will probably be a bit of a game changer. Uh, due diligence obligations are establishing a risk management system, defining internal responsibilities, performing regular risk analyses, issuing policy statements, establishing preventative measures within the own business unit and towards direct suppliers, and taking corrective action. There's also a requirement to establish complaints procedures, implementing risk due diligence with indirect suppliers. So as well as a requirement for regular reporting. So these are, are no longer voluntary codes, no longer optional. Um, the, the, the whole pace of changes is very significant. And there is a plethora of emerging legislation in, in other countries as well, such as Norway, and we're seeing um, other countries like Belgium beginning to adopt um, uh, proposed legislation, which is similar in vain to the French and the German legislation. If we can move to the next slide, please. So the other um, two points that are worth making before I just finish on this last slide, the EU directive, which is proposed, I think will begin to um, harmonize and make some consistency here in terms of um, uh, cross pan European standards. Um, the application is going to be broad. We, we know that it'll cover large undertakings, all listed companies, but there is talk of it applying to small and medium sized businesses if they're operating in certain high risk sectors. Um, the type of words that we expect to be um, utilized in the directive will be things like identifying, assessing, preventing, ceasing, mitigating, monitoring, communicating, accounting for, and remediating. Um, so these words in their own right will give you a real flavor for the direction of, of travel. You don't actually have to say too much more than those words to know that the EU directive is going to be significant. And to a large extent, we have some governments moving first. Will they be required to modify or update legislation once the directive is passed and they have to introduce it into their own member state law? Time will tell. And I thought the comments yesterday from von der Leyen talking about proposed ban on products made um, from forced labor, again, this was the statement that was made to the, uh, uh, in a policy speech to the European Parliament. Again, it shows the direction of travel that we're moving in. This last slide is developed in more detail in the uh, human rights due diligence brochure that our firm have recently produced. And I suspect that this is a good um, trail for the panel that will follow, who will have much more uh, insight into some of these issues than I do. Um, but these are some of the key things that I think businesses need to consider in light of this emerging law. Uh, board ownership is vital. Um, this isn't something that can be allocated to one department. Board approval of a public policy commitment, executive engagement and leadership is going to be key. 
ensuring the right people have clear day-to-day -day responsibilities, identifying appropriate funding, which is so often missing in this area. Corporates want to be seen to be doing something, but are often too slow to put hands in pockets and actually drive the change from the top. That will change as legislation drives that change. Um, human rights um, governance gap analysis. What is the business already doing? It's, it's vital that you look at this new law in the context of what's going on already. There's a huge momentum at the moment behind ESG. A lot of corporates have chosen to voluntarily report are already requiring complying with some laws and therefore I do think that it requires a, a, a desktop review but also a much deeper analysis and, and the development of a governance action plan. Due diligence risk assessments, um, uh, risk assessments on your own business and supply chains, consider beyond your first tier, consider where products come from. I was talking to a client yesterday um, who has serious concerns about certain products that they use and the, the minerals and the locations and sources for, for those products. Increasingly, companies are seeking out advice on what to do about problem products. Um, develop your risk prioritization report. I think it's it's got to be reasonable. It's got to be proportionate. There's certain things that you'll be able to influence. There's certain things that companies won't. Stakeholder engagement and collaboration is going to be key risk management steps, um, preventing prioritized uh, risks, and, and looking carefully at remediation. What does that look like? Finally, um, too many companies have not tracked reports. I mean, one of the features of the early modern slavery statements was that year two and three statements resembled very closely year one statements. Um, it's important to set yourself KPIs and for this not to be seen as a one-off project. It, it has to be part of a company's DNA, given the evolving legislative scene. So I'm going to finish there. I think I'm just about on time. <laughs> okay. On the minute, correct. Perfect timing. Thank you, Tom. And that was a very good introduction into the topic, topic to make sure we're on the same page. With that, I really would like directly to go into the panel in order to get the views of different actors from different parts of the world. And I would like to start with Renato Hornengraus. Renato Hornengraus is the managing director at the BDA, which is the German Employees Federation, but she is also the IE vice president for the ILO and also the employer spokesperson at the ILO. And in Germany, of course, we have a supply chain law which will impact companies from next year onwards. Renate, if you could give us your view, what will be the impact, what will be opportunities and challenges? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. And um, let me say, first of all, um, that I'm really very happy about this um, webinar, which takes place jointly with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. So hello also to Andrea. Um, the co-host of this really, um, and we have a wonderful panel. Um, I would like to particularly greet one of our next speakers, um, Wiseman and Kuchlu, Professor Wiseman and Kuchlu. He is not only chair of the South Africa, but he is the former long-standing president of the IOE. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Wiseman, again in um, your new function um, in an IOE context. Let me also say, uh, and this goes especially to Matthias, but also to, to my colleague, uh, Paul Noll, who has been very active that this report, which you have produced together with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung is really excellent. And um, I think it will be very useful for businesses. Um, what I can say from the perspective of German business, but also of business altogether is uh, to just um, reinforce what Tom has already explained uh, in very, very articulate terms. What we observe is a solidification of soft law into hard law. And this, of course, poses huge problems for companies because they are sourcing uh, in very different countries. And the principle so far is that um, they have to respect the national legislation. Uh, of the country in which they are active. And when they are sourcing, they are buying a product. They are not investing in that country. So we, we see a certain um, 
um, sort of the, the frontiers between investment and business relations or sourcing are somehow uh, dissolved. And uh, this creates huge problems when companies are made responsible for situations in other independent companies, which are legal entities uh, in their own right. Um, the second point I would like to make is that we also, and, and Tom has made this very clear, we have a, a companies are faced with a disparity of legal requirements. Uh, Tom has already shown the different national legislations that have been adopted and uh, partly already implemented, and some are in the process of being implemented. But uh, companies will have to look at all these different legislation, be it the Modern Slavery Act from the UK, be it the um, uh, Loi Vigilance from France, the German um, legislation on uh, supply chains. And finally, they will have to make sure that they respect all these very, very diverse and diverging re um, requirements if they want to be on the safe side. Um, Add to that, and I think that's that's really um, to, to just to complete the picture, um, the EU level and the international level developments. Let me just remind you that um, at EU level, it's not only the discussion on the um, human rights due diligence law, which is very controversial, but we have we will have to expect, I'm afraid, given the political context, a very very broad and very tough legislation, but uh, we also have the ongoing revision of the non-financial reporting directive. We have the um, um, implement uh, adoption or um, elaboration of a social taxonomy for reporting at European level. And of course, by um, introducing reporting obligations, you somehow in indirectly introduce, of course, obligations for action. So what does all this mean um, for companies? And then I, I haven't, sorry, I haven't mentioned the um, OECD developments where the OECD is also um, revising and overhauling its um, um, OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises. Um, and in the ILO, finally, we will be working on supply chains um, in the next year. Um, and we will not be able to exclude, even if we try to avoid it, we will not be able to exclude a, um, a convention or some kind of binding text coming out of the ILO within the coming years. What does this mean for companies? Now, regarding the German legislation, um, we have already some studies which were made in particular for the um, um, mechanical and uh, industries, the uh, metal and mechanical industries. And here, what uh, the um, institute which has made this um, study is really saying is that um, in the engineering and mechanical sector, which is just one of the sectors in Germany which is uh, affected by this legislation, the current situation is that at least 4.2% of direct intermediate products come from countries which are considered by the International Trade Union Confederation as problematic with regard to their working conditions. And when you take indirect sourcing of upstream products, you move up to nearly 10%. And this only refers to working conditions. It doesn't refer to all the other human rights. So if we really look at the implementation of the German legislation, it will mean that companies will have to make huge, huge uh, due diligence exercises involving auditing, involving um, lots of indicators in, along the supply chain. And this increases costs enormously. Uh, we will also increase the legal risks. And finally, just to make it short for this first round, there is a politicization uh, which is happening because we now see that NGOs are attacking um, companies uh, for sourcing products in um, China, in Xinjiang, which is of course a very, very political issue. And this is um, 
putting companies into a really difficult situation, which will force them to reduce the number of their suppliers, to pull out from many company, countries. And that's not good for international business and international economic development. Thank you for this first round. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Renate. Thank you so much. And we're getting questions already in the Q&A and in the chat, and I encourage all of you to really use it. I would like to come to you, Mr. Kabir. You are the president of the Bangladeshi Employers Federation, and you are also a businessman on your own. To give us your view about what is the impact of all this legislation for companies in Bangladesh, and there is of course a lot of garment supply chain in Bangladesh, which are producing for the global market. There is a question in the chat, and so in your answer, you might directly want to reply to that which comes from Sune. Sune, of course, is well known um, as a key expert on human rights. And he asked the question, since all companies are covered by the UN guiding principles, all of them should do due diligence. So is your federation, perhaps, Mr. M. Kabir, already engaged in supporting your member companies, the garment suppliers, um, on due diligence? Over to you, Mr. Kabir. And just to answer that very quickly, I'm essentially, before I start, uh, of course we are, but, you know, capacity building is a long drawn out affair. And I'll touch upon that, you know, I've got basically five minutes to say a lot. So I, uh, you'll have to forgive me if I read it out rather than speak because it'll just take too long. Yeah? So uh, may I just start uh, by saying good day to all of you, uh, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a very good morning and a very good afternoon. I thank the IOE and the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for arranging this event on such an important topic. And um, I'd like to thank them also for inviting me as a panelist. Uh, just to touch briefly on the background, which has been uh, comprehensively dealt with, especially by Tom Blair. Uh, in the past decade, the UNGPs have had a significant impact and driven progress on human rights at work. Uh, the UNGPs have had a significant impact and the human rights due diligence as a process is now defined, understood and practiced by companies, which was not the case some time back. It was, complete, uh, it was a completely new thing to people at that time. And I'm speaking as the president of an employers federation who speaks to members every day. I mean, they are now quite aware of what is going on. In fact, some of them have also gone so far as to uh, read quite a bit of the basis of the legislation, uh, starting from the Dodd-Frank Act of 2012, right down to, you know, where the Germans have obviously considered every convention in sight and would want us to also look into soil conservation, environments, and, and you know, every aspect of due diligence, which is fine. I mean, you know, the world is going that way and we owe, owe a duty of care to, to everyone, not just the workers, to the people, to the consumers. And, and that is how we feel. Um, I'm just to touch on legislation due to diligence, 10 years on from the United Nations introducing the UNGPs. We're considering basically a raft of legislation which seeks to systematically implement, implement by law as opposed to voluntarily human rights due diligence and supply chains. The interesting question is, what is the driving force behind all this legislation? I mean, I mean from, from a layman's point of view, it's, it's fascinating to me. The, where, where is it coming from? I mean, it wasn't there 10 years ago. I mean, you know, this dry, it was basically to do with human trafficking. It was to do with anti-slavery. It was to do with child labor. But now we encompass everything. And... Um, I think it's a very simple thing. I mean, there are deep, dark conspiracies about uh, leftist uh, ideologues trying to derail capitalism and all kinds of nonsense. But, you know, essentially, I think it just comes from the fact that consumer attitudes have changed and that shift is reflected in the responses of the politicians and the younger generation of consumers turned voters are a potent political force who demand that their politicians respond to and act upon their desire to live in a fairer and more equitable world. I mean, I, you know, you may think that's idealistic, but, you know, I, just judging from my own children, I think that is the case. Of late, uh, we have witnessed a number of legislative initiatives. I won't go into all that. We all know, I mean, you're starting from the Dodd-Frank Act. We had right down to 2021. Uh, and the German and Norwegian parliaments adopted these new laws. And as far as we are concerned, Bangladeshi companies who are part of the supply chains of EU and US companies also have to comply. There's no choice about it. So we've got to you know, bite the bullet, accept it, and get used to it and work upon it. 
Uh, there are some key considerations in the legislation, though for business and the debate on legislation going forward. Firstly, and I'll just touch upon it because we've got so little time, uh, the issue of liability, the issue of sanctions, the elimination of safe, safe harbor clauses, uh, the reversal of burden of proof, which is astonishing. I mean, you know, anyone should even consider that because that is the fundamental uh, basis of all at least Anglophile law, Anglo-centric law. Um, extraterritorial jurisdiction, extraterritorial jurisdiction creates grave uncertainties as to where the accused may be taken into court and to which laws they may be subject. And this has long-term effects on various aspects of investment. Human rights due diligence is an integral part of a company's responsibility to respect human rights. However, on its own, it will not be able to solve the world's problems and nor will they be able to address systemic issues deep down in the supply chain. After all, we're just businessmen. You know, we are not the world's superpower. Uh, innovative approaches and partnerships between different actors are key to addressing systemic, systemic issues, which one actor alone will not be able to resolve. One good example of innovative partnership approaches is the Alliance 8.7, which brings together all actors, governments, social partners, uh, civil society, the UN, et cetera, uh, to focus on the eradication of child labor in line with the SDGs. I think that is an absolutely brilliant initiative, and it has done uh, you know, marvelous work. Another initiative worth mentioning is the call to action in the garment industry, an alliance of international, national employer and work organizations, companies, multi-stakeholder initiatives, governments, and the ILO to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the garment industry. I mean, only a small, I mean, we must bear in mind that only a small fraction of workers are actually linked to the global supply chain and a lot of, a lot of uh, countries all over the world. More than 60% of the global workforce is in the informal economy. It is there in the informal economy where the human rights risks are the highest. So in order to encompass all workers uh, 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 together, a much more broad-based approach is required. Any due diligence re regulations can be only one part of a more comprehensive initiative and approach in which support must be given to address weak governance, a dearth of institutions, lack of access to basic services, and dare I say, corruption, and insufficient judicial systems at the local level. I mean, it can be counterproductive to impose the burden of compliance on businesses operating in extremely difficult circumstances already. I mean, you know, this can lead to a flight of capital. It can result in uncertainties, which lead to low foreign direct investment. It will lead to unemployment and also shift the workers to the informal sector. And crucially, SMEs in particular will not be able to cope with the pace of change. Small and medium-sized enterprises are the essential backbone of all economies around the world. And dare I say it, I mean, you know, there is an argument to say that small and medium enterprises are also the very pillar of a liberal democracy. Thank you, Mr. Kabir, Mr. Kabir, Mr. President. Yeah. That is a, it was really great for the first round, and we do come for sure back. Thank Excellent. You. Great. Uh, Thank you. To our next speaker, uh, Marit, just to flag, there are several questions for the companies which refer. So during Professor Weisman Kuklu speaks, you might want to look at them. One question refers to in how far human rights should be in the governance structure. Another question refers, how do you deal with social, um, social audit companies? How do you make sure that they are doing a good job? The third question was with regard to pricing policy. So Marit, perhaps you can have a look into that during um, Professor Weisman Kuklu will speak. You, Mr. Weisman, as said, are the former IE president. Thank you so much that you joined us today. It's a great, great honor. You are the chair of KPMG South Africa. South Africa, of course, you have your own laws with regard to responsible business conduct, particularly for the stock exchange. So you have both the perspective of impact of companies in South Africa, positively and perhaps challenging, as well as the impact of external legislation on supplier in the country. Over to you, Professor. Well, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I appreciate the very kind words by Raneta. I've got great memories uh, during my time at the IOE and I, con I continue to be its advocate where I am, but thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for invitation to participate in this uh, workshop. 
issues on human rights, uh, due, due diligence and supply chain law, what business needs to do. You know, the call for business to accept responsibility and accountability, not only for financial performance, but for impact on other stakeholders has been on the rise, on the ascendancy for some time. Uh, uh, countries like South Africa, we responded first to the 10 principles of the United, uh, of the Global Compact. And we use that as a basis to actually think about uh, accountability of business on, on human rights. In South Africa, the companies are required in terms of the Companies Act to establish uh, specialized special committees, subcommittees of the board that are called social and ethics committee. And the mandate of those committee is to look on issues around the conduct of the business on human rights issues, safety, and also how workers, are, you know, impact on workers, and also the impact of the, activity, of the activities of the, of the company on uh, suppliers. And uh, of course, we've got a big mining sector. So the issue of impact of mining companies on communities, those things are, are the kind of issues that uh, should be governed by these uh, social and ethics committee. But in addition to that, we've always had the code of good corporate governance that uh, in South Africa is named after it's, it's, it's proponent, uh, Mervyn King, King 4. In, in terms of King 4, companies in South Africa, big and small, are required to have, um, to, uh, it's principle three of the code that says, yeah, our companies have to be good corporate citizens. Being good corporate citizens, it means primarily uh, respecting the human rights. Uh, in explaining, what really uh, good, uh, being a good corporate citizen entails. The code clearly says that uh, respecting the human rights, human rights, not only of your employees, but also human rights of the people on which you, you have an impact as a company, not only suppliers, especially for companies that are in mining, also communities. So these have been, uh, strongly promoted in South Africa and companies are just, uh, are, are leading companies are required to participate in a competition or for integrated reports where the one of the, um, the you know, criteria used is to actually check the extent to which they actually take responsibility for human rights and account for them. So in terms of really the good practice in terms of King 4, companies, are, the, the, the boards of directors are expected to take responsibility among others for uh, the culture of the business, including human rights. And that, uh, that responsibility is also has to be in the KPIs of the chief executive, and there has to be proper uh, risk management processes and reporting in the integrated report. Where I believe that this um, exercise of really bringing to the fore and to the attention of business, these United Nations uh, guiding principles and, and a due diligence framework is that much as we had these practices in South Africa, there's lack of um, consistency, there's a lot, lot of diversity, and the fact that because of that, you know, there is no standardization. So I, I, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, leading business in South Africa, including business leadership South Africa to which they belong, uh, would really welcome and would encourage our own government to actually use the guidelines and the due diligence uh, uh, mechanism to actually strengthen our own legislation to make sure that uh, this, this would ensure, would level the playing field. Because uh, companies now, uh, you know, when it's standardized, 
and uh, their cost involved in complying with these standards. So it helps a lot when there is proper, not just guidance, but global guidelines and that are incorporated in local legislation so that there is standardization and uniformity. So this is very welcome. And I believe that also as an auditor, for me, it would greatly strengthen the public trust in the commitment of business to these guidelines, not uh, to the guidelines. And of course, legislation is going to be of great help, but it will greatly strengthen if we can make sure that uh, in the work that the World Economic Forum is doing in coming up what they call stakeholder capitalism metrics to measure uh, the, 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 the progress of companies that they're making on SDGs, sustainability, and so on. If there could be a metric on this issue of human rights and make sure that the, the, the IOE influences that, because for that to be strong, it cannot be just left to business. I believe that OE should also be a player on that. I believe that there should be a, a proper metrics, metrics for measuring compliance. And also if you do that, there will have to be a professional body that actually can actually audit those and make sure that when companies say they, they, they comply, they actually do so. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I, I believe that this is a major step after COVID, this is what business should do, accept higher levels of accountability and responsibility for human rights and make sure that we encourage companies all over the world to ensure that they commit to these standards and these due diligence processes. Thank you very much. That was my initial remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. And there, as I said, there is a question in the chat, how do we ensure that the social auditor who audit suppliers are doing a proper job, a good job. And perhaps, you know, because KPMG is of course an auditing company, you might in the chat directly re um, reply to this question because it's an important one, right? How to make sure yes. that the auditing company are actually a proper one. So perhaps if you could go into the chat and reply to this question, that would be great. Our next okay. speaker is Marit berger Rosland. She is the vice president from Equinor. Equinor is based in Norway. So you are covered also by a due diligence law, which will um, is adapted, but not yet in, in effect. So from the company as perspective, what would be the opportunities of these laws? And we heard already from the professor, uh, Weissman and Kuklu, you know, level playing field, clearer understanding, but what might be also the challenges? And then if you uh, might also just ask, to, um, uh, reply to the two questions which were referring about the governance of human rights within the company, about what do you do about your auditors? And, uh, and the third question was about pricing and policies with regards to um, human rights. Although for you as an oil or energy company, this is probably not such a relevant question. Over to you, Marit. Thank you, Matthias, and good afternoon. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about uh, an important topic here today. Uh, as mentioned, Equinord, broad energy company based in Norway, uh, focusing on oil and gas, offshore wind renewables, um, Norwegian state, our main shareholder, uh, and clear expectations to us uh, towards uh, conducting our business in a responsible way. Uh, and we have lived internally with our internal requirements for human rights uh, due diligence uh, in accordance with the UN guiding principles for quite some time now. Uh, so this is uh, not new to us in, in many ways. And we, from that perspective, uh, welcome actually the shift from, from soft law to, to hard law, uh, because it's, it's about uh, leveling the playing field as many have already mentioned. Uh, but we of course hope for uh, clear legal requirements and also some degree of harmonization when it comes to the legal framework that we need to adhere to, because uh, having multiple initiatives, various reporting formats, will actually um, move resources away from doing uh, the actual work when it comes to mitigating human rights risks. So that's, uh, that's something important for us to, to remind in, uh, in these discussions. Um, and when it comes to legislation, just one quick word about the Norwegian Transparency Act, because uh, coming from Norway, that's, uh, that's the, the, the legal framework most important for us short term. And it has a lot of similarities with the German uh, supply chain law, but it's um, based from the title, you understand that 
transparency is really the key part of the Norwegian legislation. We have to have uh, corporate reporting requirements. That's not unique, but we can actually also be faced with um, information requests from any interested third parties that want to look into uh, how we have conducted our human rights due diligence and the actions that we have taken based on that work. So quite extreme amount of transparency when it comes to how we perform and do our due diligence job. Uh, I think one challenge that we have addressed and see so far is that um, we are in a number of, of countries internationally. Partners may not be under the same legal requirements as us. Um, the boundaries between transparency and also confidentiality will be challenged uh, under these laws uh, and we will I think face some dilemmas uh, on those issues uh, going forward. Um, we have our human rights policy. Uh, I will say just a few words about the governance since that has been asked to others. I think I need to, to address later. But when it comes to governance, we have a policy. It's adopted by the board. Um, it makes it, uh, makes it mandatory for us to perform human rights due diligence in a systematic way. Um, it's the corporate sustainability function Nekpinur, that owns this policy, but legal is supporting the work uh, closely. But it's, it's not legal or the compliance department that owns our human rights policy. And I think uh, even though there are quite a lot of similarities when it comes to building a program for this, it's still also distinct differences uh, when it comes to how to work on human rights due diligence compared to traditional due diligence. And I would underline that to actually be efficient on human rights due diligence, you need to be in a way out in the field. You need to have cultural awareness. You need to have the language. You need to build trust in order to really identify some of the uh, challenging issues when it comes to human rights. So we cooperate uh, on these issues with third parties being experts within these fields to make sure that we actually are efficient when it comes to finding the risks. Um, so what do we actually do? Uh, we have um, integrated human rights into our Equinoid risk management tool. Uh, we have adjusted then the methodology to reflect that it is risk to people. That is the primarily perspective for this risk. And we have two formal reviews per year, reported then from the asset unit level and upwards in the organization. So we have formalized the, the risk part of this already. Um, but of course, this is a, a huge task and to do the prioritization uh, when it comes to our business areas uh, where we have most exposure uh, and to, to make the work complete is a quite uh, challenging task. Um, from the German legislation, we see that you know, we need to have focus on the supply chain and we agree to that. And it's also a big focus for us internally. We have a, a risk-based screening and prioritization approach to make sure that we look at the contracts that pose the biggest risk to people and which are closestly linked to our own operations. And we, of course, need to follow up when there is a known concern raised uh, in regards to an, any of our contracts or business um, uh, relations. And we strive to cooperate with our first the tier of suppliers, and we have a good experience with that. Uh, so um, detecting a risk to people and even an existing adverse impact on people's rights is the first step, and mitigating and addressing this risk is uh, where the real work starts. And um, we have to keep in mind that even though these processes and reporting formats may be quite complex, it's it's actually the goal of this to make a difference to, to people and to, to their uh, you know, working conditions and their, their life, actually. So um, we have to remind ourselves that's the ultimate goal of everything we do in, within this area. But I'll stop there for now and uh, thank you for, for the time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Perhaps one question directly to you, Mark. What do you do? How do you choose your third party? Um, your third party partners who, you know, to perform, for instance, your social audits, because that was also a question in the chat. How do you make sure that these are, you know, proper organizations which do a good job? We have, uh, you know, quite complex uh, processes to do, I mean, uh, 
quality assurance on, on, the, on the people we work with within these areas, but we typically use internationally recognized companies within human rights due diligence. And I think some of them are present here today as well. So we, we try to work with the experts and we have our internal resources in addition. Uh, but if we have you know, a resettlement issue, we will look for someone uh, to you know, have the competence to assist in that in, in, uh, in a proper way. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I would like now to turn to Fernando Yanez Amansa. You represent the Mexican employers. Mexico, of course, is very much also impacted by the rules from the trade agreement between the US, Canada, and Mexico. Um, so there is a lot of rules coming from that part, as well as then, of course, um, supply chain regulation from companies who are sourcing from Mexico. Fernando, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, such an honor to be sharing a panel with all these team colleagues. Um, so I would just like to share with you a brief presentation to walk you through um, what uh, I believe is the current situation and the most relevant points that should be discussed. Um, can you tell me if you see my screen? Perfectly. Great. All right. Um, well, um, uh, it's just very brief points uh, using a support of uh, what we're talking about here. Um, when we talk about Mexico, as for sure you may know, um, right now we're going into a transformation as a country. And um, there has been major changes, not only in public policies, but also how the government views is trying to uh, uh, change what was going on from previous administration to shift into what is now a new project of nation. So that has had a major impact, uh, not only in, um, in domestic agenda, but also in the international commitment, commitments that we have. And specifically talking about the human rights in businesses, our last administration, the federal government, was in a, in a project where they assembled a working task to actually enact legislation that adapted to the commitments of the UN Guiding Principles and especially um, create a legal domestic framework to address these issues. However, that was stopped and as it has been said, it, the issue has been politicized. So with that in mind, um, just let's put where we are standing right now in Mexico and what, what's going on. Because when we talk about the, 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 the human rights, we also need to take into consideration everything else that's going on and how that's impacting either uh, the way they're being enforced or the lack of enforcement. So right now, and talking about the labor and employment and law perspective. We're in the road to implement a new justice system. Uh, this is directly uh, addressed in the USMCA, uh, where not only there's a list of all the essential principles and uh, main labor rights and provisions that should be uh, included in any, in any country, uh, but also with a very uh, specialized um, body of uh, a, a sanctioning body to address these issues in case Mexico, specifically Mexico, does not comply with its commitments before Canada and the, and the US. So this has been a major transformation for us, um, not only because we uh, have been uh, into, uh, we, we've seen the, 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 the impact that these new agreements have created, for Mexican entities and employers, but also how the government now needs to address these new commitments uh, as opposed to the old um, free trade agreement that we had with these countries. Um, secondly, we've been having, uh, in these specifically past years during the pandemic, we had uh, some uh, very important changes in the labor policies that created a series of a new obligations for employers that we now have to bear in mind in order for us to continue uh, with the correct, um, with, with, with correct uh, uh, compliance policies in every, in, in every company. 
Um, along that, our government has implemented an austerity policy, which basically has cut all kinds of funding to very important institutions, including those that are, that are um, created to supervise what would be any, um, any uh, violation in the workplace. And that, be, that will become a big problem because as I will uh, address a little bit later, um, now they're trying to shift all these supervising powers to the companies themselves which is, uh, it, it might be problematic. Um, and of course, if we, if we would like for the government to help to, to, to enact these uh, regulations properly, we would, we would be asking for the help and uh, we'll be asking for right funding to all the uh, government agencies that are in charge of implementing and enforcing all these regulations. Um, finally, I would say that the pandemic recovery has been kind of troublesome. It's good news right now. We can say that the, um, all the the job the, all the jobs lost during the pandemic have been officially recovered according to the latest data. However, right now we've seen again a loss of formal employment, and it's been specifically in the last months when the new regulations on outsourcing schemes specifically were enacted. So there there is a correlation in between all of them. And finally, the, 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 the tax collection policy of the government has been brutal. Uh, so that's what is going on in Mexico right now. And uh, we're not talking only about uh, what human rights um, uh, protection uh, is about. We're talking about how the government is actually addressing the whole, the, the, the whole uh, um, sphere around a, a corporation. So, what does, all, what does this all mean? Well, for us in the justice system, I would say that uh, we are expecting to have a more transparent and speedy process. Um, part of this uh, reform is addressed by the USMCA. We do have a commitment with the USA and Canada to finish the whole transformation um, by, the, by the beginning of 2023. So we don't have much time to actually finish it. This justice system not only aims for uh, the dispute resolution, but also to make sure that the, um, uh, all the um, um, labor rights and uh, freedom of negotiation can be actually enacted. So that's a good change because we're actually starting to look right now a positive um, uh, shift on how the employees and the unions are now um, engaging to, in, uh, together and uh, making sure that new, uh, new, new, new voices are heard, that the workplaces are, um, are making sure that labor rights are being uh, respected and, uh, and so on. Um, then the outsourcing reform well, has been a major transformation for us because uh, before we used to regulate this specific scheme with a very, very low standard and uh, in the past months, we have been um, we have been ha uh, working a lot, I would say, on the enactment of these new regulations, which basically um, aim to tackle what was used as a, a as in the businesses as a, as a way to evade taxes and to create working conditions that were below the minimum standards that we were talking about. So. Um, we hope that with these new regulations, we can actually create better workplaces. We can actually create uh, a, a more um, fair playground for everybody. Um, That's great. So it's a really focus on improving the legal framework at national level. So it's easier for companies actually to fulfill their responsibility to respect human rights. So the framework at national level is improving. So it makes much easier actually for the companies to be also fulfilling the expectation from suppliers from outside. I'm sorry, Fernando, because we have to move on because of the limited time. Please, don't worry, don't worry. This initial statement, that is really great. I would like now to come to Gabriela Ricertzuk. She is 
The um, Vice President for Seas and Human Rights at USCIB, the US member of the IE. She is also the chair of the IE Policy Working Group on Human Rights and Responsible Business Conduct. And of course, she is engaged in all this topic also at international level, particularly in the uh, negotiation on the binding treaty on business and human rights, which will take place again in um, four weeks, three weeks, four weeks, 25th of October. Gabriela, over to you. Thank you so much, dear IOE. And thank you to the Conrad uh, Adenauer Stiftung um, Foundation uh, for commissioning this very important research. I'm very glad and honored to be on this panel together with colleagues. Um, what can I say? I mean, I'm at towards the end here and um, so many folks have made so many important points. I'll just be brief. Um, fully agree, and it's obvious, just look at the trajectory. Human rights due diligence is no longer a nice to do, must do. And talked a bit about why is this happening? Certainly the UNGPs um, are, were an important um, determination point uh, where it's clarified pillar two, corporate responsibility to respect and human rights due diligence obligation, uh, requirements and expectations. And we've seen a growth of mandatory human rights due diligence as well at national levels. And Matthias, as you pointed out, even though some of these are national, like say in Germany or Switzerland, their impact is global because we're connected. Um, there are many positives about the um, trend in um, expectations that now um, human rights due diligence are, 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 um, are the way of, of doing business. There, John Ruggie, Professor Ruggie talked about uh, human rights due diligence as knowing and showing. Many companies now, um, primarily global multinationals who were the ones who are really demonstrating implementation of pillar two, they're, carrying out due diligence. They're gaining better understanding of their risks. They're taking action through corrective action plans, through the knowledge they're gaining through auditing, et cetera. Um, and they're publishing this, right? They're showing it as well and, and discussing it um, in corporate responsibility reports so that there's more information available. There's much that they're doing that's private, that they're not discussing, where they're having direct discussions when they're identifying issues of concern in supply chain and directly engaging um, those suppliers and remediating on a daily basis. These are positives. There's also many challenges we've discussed as well. Um, yes, laws have demonstrated implementation from global multinational corporations, but we don't have enough implementation on the part of SMEs, of uh, medium-sized enterprises, state-owned enterprises. The UNGPs are clear. And as your very valuable report points out, this um, expectation applies to all businesses of every size in every sector in every country. And we have gaps. We have gaps in this regard. Um, the proliferation of the different varied um, expectations is a big challenge for companies who are working to implement. And the big issue that we know that we need to talk more about is that national level implementation is a spotty in terms of um, realizing rights. Um, it, we, it remains poor in far too many countries. And we know this from World Bank statistics, OECD statistics, uh, different government um, reports like the US Department of Labor. We know this from the ILO. We don't have enough implementation at the national levels. And, and respectfully, a human rights due diligence report from California or Illinois is not going to remedy this alone. It's an important piece, but without this national level implementation piece, we're not gonna move forward. So, so where do we go forward? Um, because we want to uh, bring to life over the next decade the legacy and importance of Professor John Ruggie's work. And I want to emphasize it wasn't Professor Ruggie alone, it was his team. He had a very robust team. We have at least one of the members, uh, former members of that team here on the call. And, 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 and 
USCIB and many of us on this call participated in the development of the UNGPs and were committed to their realization and deepening and broadening going forward. So thanks to the important report today from uh, IOE and Conrad Adnar Stiftung. Um, uh, uh, companies of all sizes now have a resource to better understand um, this trend, a resource about um, some of the important issues that they need to be engaging on with policymakers and with civil society at the national level when they're part and participating in national action plan development. If there's mandatory due diligence legislation development, they can use this tool, this resource at the national level um, to implement. My personal final call uh, to uh, all of us is we need to be studying what works. So we have a, 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 a broadening and proliferation of mandatory human rights due diligence expectations. Is it working? We're all committed to advancing human rights everywhere for everyone. And the report um, highlighted a very important question about how's it going when it studied is in, in a, about um, uh, conflict minerals and the DRC. We certainly can observe, and we could even probably on the back of an envelope quantify the dollars um, expended to produce the important conflict minerals reports. Um, that the companies are doing with support from outside counsel and auditing firms and the headcount to produce all of this, right? Um, how is it going? And uh, again, important learnings on the part of companies to better map their supply chains to the smelter level. All of this is positive, but we have to look at impact on the ground for citizens and workers. And as you highlight in your report, regrettably in the case of conflict minerals and DRC, it, we have some work to do. We'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. I look forward to participating um, further in this discussion and beyond with colleagues at IOE um, and um, look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriela, and also for all your commitment and support for the IE policy working group and the work you're doing there. Rachel Davis, you were already introduced as one of the team members of John Ruggie. You had been directly involved in the drafting of the UN Guiding Principles. You are now the vice president of SHIFT, so one of the really international now and experts on business and human rights. Um, your perspective would be very important, but I have already three questions to you, which you might directly somehow put into your intervention. The first one the question was um, by Austria, um, how do you do due diligence beyond tier one, right? How do you go to tier two, tier three, tier four? Another question which we received is, how does it come that we suddenly have all this legislation popping up? There were already responses from our colleague from Bangladesh, the president of EF, who said, well, it's the youth who wants it, the consumer. But perhaps you have also an additional answer to that. And then the third question which we received was, how good is good enough? So who is telling a company that the due diligence, what they're doing is proper and sufficient? Um, three difficult questions, perhaps somehow you can also answer to them. And everyone who has a question, please put them in the chat. That is your chance that afterwards we go back and have all of them answered. So please, if you have a question or a comment, put them in the chat. Rachel, over to you. Thank you very much, Matthias. So you're saying I have half an hour, right? Um, just kidding. Uh, thank you uh, sincerely for the invitation to join today. Um, it is actually a very sad week for me, um, as Gabrielle acknowledged too, uh, personally, and, and for Shift with the passing of John Ruggie and for many of you who knew him. Um, but John was excited about the move towards mandatory measures in Europe, so I'm pleased to be discussing this with you all. Um, I think given the strong interest that we've heard again today in the level playing field, uh, I want to focus a little on that and I'll try to weave in some answers to those questions. Um, at SHIFT, we think it's really important that businesses engage proactively on what the consequences for not reaching a, a new legal standard of conduct should look like. Uh, because without a robust set of consequences, that level playing field that's very popular uh, will not be achieved. And we think it's important to start by reminding ourselves that the guiding principles when we worked on them um, clearly foresaw the relevance of liability uh, as one form of accountability where business causes or contributes to harm, as Tom said, and that's in guiding principle 17. But at the same time, 
We all agree uh, that mandatory due diligence should not be a box ticking exercise. It ought to drive the right practices and behaviors inside companies that lead to better outcomes for people. That's the point. Uh, people within Europe and people uh, very much outside Europe as well. And so it's for this reason that we think there also needs to be a more nuanced discussion of some of the concerns that business has about liability being applied across the whole value chain uh, and the more rigid compliance or, or uh, risk averse, frankly, approaches that that could bring. When what we actually want to encourage is creative use of leverage when dealing with entities deep in the supply chain who are often involved with systemic harms that are hard to fix. But I think instead of a, a nuanced discussion of these admittedly really difficult topics to talk about, um, what we tend to see in these debates, legal debates at the moment, is um, an assumption that liability and the responsibility to do due diligence are the same, that they're overlapping circles. Um, and then we get arguments naturally about, okay, well, where do we draw the line? Do we draw it at tier one, tier two? Uh, do we do it on the basis of size of the business, uh, limit it to the largest and so forth? But as we've heard from others, the, the UNGPs don't see size or tiers uh, as limiting factors when it comes to due diligence. Um, and I think just to quote John, actually, from January this year, uh, he said in public comments, the question that everybody is asking is how many levels down does a company have to go? The answer from companies is we are willing to do tier one. The answer from others is we want to include all layers in the supply chain. But to me, he said, that's the wrong question. The answer shouldn't be defined by layers in the supply chain. It should be driven by wherever a company's due diligence identifies salient human rights risks, no matter where they are. That is where you go. And I think we keep having the conversation this way because we keep seeing uh, doing due diligence and liability as the same circles. Uh, and I think what we've been trying to encourage at SHIFT is distinct but complementary forms of accountability that can distinguish between situations of uh, clear causation or contribution by a business um, where liability is likely to be relevant and where a company is linked to impacts which could extend to both ends of, of the value chain to, to answer Sune's question in the chat. And we think that properly resourced administrative supervision has an essential role to play, uh, especially in this latter respect. And to get this mix right, states really need to think about what is unique about due diligence when they design their enforcement approaches. And this is happening right now in Europe, as we know. Um, and, and I wanna give two, uh, maybe three examples to, to help try answer the questions that you raised. Um, first, that administrative supervision and accountability should encourage greater risk disclosure. It's not evidence of a breach of due diligence that you identify significant risks in your supply chain. It's a breach if you do nothing at all about the most severe risks and end up actually contributing to them. Um, but how do we incentivize disclosure and acting on risk? Uh, in the consumer um, protection space, there are examples where businesses can have a period of time where they can come forward uh, and disclose that they've identified uh, serious impacts. But if they're taking credible steps to address them, then that's accepted by the regulator. So there's a, some interesting practice we can look at in other areas. Um, a second point, we need to ensure that sanctions don't lead to just cutting and running. Uh, from business relationships when we know that's the opposite of what the guiding principles intend. It's the opposite usually of what's good for workers uh, and those who are affected. And regulators are going to need to understand this um, when assessing company compliance, uh, that staying and using leverage and capacity building is the responsible thing to do as we heard from Marit. Um, we're also going to need agreement to, to this question, Matthias, on what quality due diligence looks like. Um, there is a risk of 27 different versions of due diligence. Uh, and the EU is going to have to take, I think, a central role in harmonizing, along with the OECD and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, who are the owners of the underlying international standards. And we want to retain convergence about that because those standards remain relevant for other regions, uh, as we've heard already. So um, just to conclude, I'm conscious of time, that uh, we think effective enforcement should support continuous improvement that encourages the majority of companies to move from the middle ground uh, of baseline compliance, if you like, over time towards better quality due diligence processes that are focused on outcomes for people. And we think that that needs a mix of complementary accountability approaches. Um, and we welcome further discussion about that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. That was really helpful.
Um, there's no other question in the chat. So I now go directly to Livio Sarandrea. You are leading the work on human rights within UNDP. You are very supportive of the business community by organizing these convenings like the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights in Asia and South Asia. So you are very active to bring together the business community and other actors, other stakeholders. So how can the UNDP, how can the UN support business in their activities, in their business and human rights engagement? And for everyone else, for the audience, please type your question. We will have a, a quick chat afterwards. So if you have a question, put them into the Q&A function now. Over to you, Livio. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, what a fascinating conversation uh, and what an honor to speak after such a lineup of, of eloquent speakers indeed. So uh, yeah, allow me perhaps to, to start with an observation uh, reflecting of, of what those who spoke before me have said on, on, the, on the recent uh, normative developments around human rights due diligence and environmental human rights due diligence reflection that comes uh, from a European. Uh, I had to express how proud I, I am of being a European in these days, but a European that, as you pointed to, lives and works abroad in Asia, which is where I'm based uh, uh, and, and from where I run a global program for UNDP, but the focus is uh, for 90% of, of its time and resources on development in Asia. Uh, and so my observation is very much the result of what I see in Asia. And, and in Asia, mandatory due diligence has quickly become an element of, of great interest. Uh, and, and I can see it in, in all our many uh, uh, more or less weekly discussions on business and human rights we organize across our 12 countries uh, in focus here in Asia. Uh, so in this sense, I can certainly echo what, what Kabir was said before, uh, the, the knowledge that this is coming is certainly there. The concern is there. I participated to a forum in Indonesia last week and again a national dialogue in, in Malaysia yesterday and, and, and more in Mongolia. And by far the most recurring uh, questions that I received are about German Due Diligence Act or are coming uh, uh, EU normative on, on environmental human rights due diligence. The very fact that they ask the question means that uh, participants, companies mainly, are, uh, know that this is happening. And, and frankly, companies ask the question, uh, what is happening? You know, what should we expect? But I, I think more or less, the, you know, they know the answer. They, they know that the days uh, of taking shortcuts on, on human rights are counted, at least when trading uh, 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 with certain economies, let's say. I, I also see in these, in these events, legal officers of companies starting to attend our conferences uh, where once we only had the sustainability, sustainability people doing so. So they already know what is about to happen. And quite frankly, many are already taking steps to prevent losing uh, commerce, losing profits and figure out ways not only to keep the business relation with, with the EU or the Western world going, but perhaps, and this is a point I wanted to make, even increase uh, that relations, if they can flag before others that their business uh, as suppliers can be freer of risks for European companies because they are cleaner and greener. They have their due diligence in place. I also would like to know, before I go into some example of what UN does and what UNDP does in specific, I wanted to know the interest in due diligence um, beyond the EU, beyond the US, beyond the Western world. In fact, most recently I noticed uh, in conversation I had and events have taken place, a rapidly growing interest in, in human rights due diligence from Japanese companies. Um, I attend the Tokyo Human Rights, Business Human Rights Week every year. And I, and, I, and I see the questions moving from what is human rights due diligence to how do we go about human rights due diligence. So there is a clear sense that companies have understood the inevitability of, of these requirements and they want to learn how to go about it. But again, we, should make, uh, uh, we shouldn't make the mistake to think that un understanding the issue, this sort of awareness that definitely is increasing of the issue 
and even being committed to it uh, because perhaps it's the right thing to do and the wise thing to do, we shouldn't think that that translates naturally into ability to do it, in capacities to conduct human rights, uh, the uh, human rights due diligence. Um, so some have spoken before me about the complexity of, of the supply chains going beyond tier one. So the issue that I see right now is that the, uh, not much uh, the the willingness to do it is to do it, but also the capacity to do it. Again, I'm talking about Asia and the countries where we are working. So you're asked what UNDP is doing to help companies in, a, in, 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 uh, in Asia. And, and let me perhaps give you three quick uh, uh, examples. Traditionally, UNDP works with governments, right? Uh, we work on national action plans, and as, as everyone knows. But more and more in the last 24 months, we switch gear also on pillar two, on working directly with companies, because we've been asked to do so by companies and by business association. We've been approached uh, uh, by business associations and companies to help them understanding how to conduct uh, uh, due diligence. So again, three things among the many that we do. One, we just launched a manual on uh, a training facilitation guide on human rights due diligence We have already started using this guide and, and delivered uh, trainings on it. Uh, the, the manual is available, it's public, it's for everyone, of course, it's, it's, it's done by UNDP, uh, so it's available to anyone who wants to use it. Uh, importantly, we will translate it in local languages. And I'm going back to the point made by, I think the person, not Rachel, but the person who spoke before Rachel, on, on making sure that at the national level, the capacity is built. We're translating it in um, various local languages to make it accessible to companies that are not necessarily uh, 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 familiar with English and, and training in local language. Uh, let me point also to a toolkit that we made uh, to manage human rights due diligence requirements in, in the specific time of uh, COVID-19, there is a rapid self-assessment of, uh, of human rights due diligence in times of COVID-19 that has been translated in 11 languages, is available, uh, was widely disseminated, I believe also with the help of IOE. And then a third, last thing, importantly, we are now working on a guidance and a self-assessment toolkit for human rights due diligence in conflict affected areas. We are taking forward the work done by Anita Ramasasri and her report at the UNGA on, on height and human rights due diligence. With her guidance, with the guidance of the UN Working Group, we'll make available this toolkit for companies operating in environments such as those of Myanmar, Mozambique, and again, other conflict uh, affected areas. Um, I have a lot more to say, but I definitely want to maybe stop here in the interest of time and really express interest to part with IOE with specific national federations. I'm really interested in, in, in being in contact with uh, Kabir, for example, in Bangladesh. We have work in there. We want to do trainings. We want to work with you and, and, and support uh, the efforts of, of the IOE uh, at, at the country level. I'll, I'll stop here, uh, Matthias. Thank you so much, Livio. And if you could put the link to this guide you spoke about into the chat, that would be great. So all the participants can di directly download. I also will make sure you and um, Kabir coming together by email so you can directly follow up on this conversation. What is better than having a direct partnership coming out of a conference? That is a perfect outcome. From my side, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for this very great panel. We don't have any question anymore. so. Great that you have been here and I give over to Andrea for the final conclusions. Over to you, Andrea. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. And a big thank you to Tom Blair for setting the scene and our eight panelists. This has been an extremely rich discussion. Um, and to come up with concluding remarks is a challenge in itself because this is a question has really highlighted the complexities related to different legislation and their state of implementation. And we heard about the need for harmonization and the role the EU, the OECD, but also the UN can, can play in this regard. Um, Tom Blair mentioned right in the beginning 
um, that companies do not only need to pay attention to the scope of the human rights that are supposed to be protected in the respective legislation, but also to their duties enshrined in the laws. They need to do a thorough risk analysis and cover their reporting obligations. And risk analysis means risk management, including risk-based screening and prioritization. And um, reporting is one of the key elements, but also reporting necessitates harmonization because it's a big burden if companies have to report to different standards. So due diligence in relation to human rights and supply chain laws has to become a company's DNA. I think this is the kind of key message coming out of our discussion today. But we also heard that due diligence laws cannot remain isolated. They have to be part of measures addressing um, weak governance, corruption. There is a need for a national legal framework and also an adapted justice system um, that um, protects uh, human rights in, in general. Um, there, there is the need for global guidelines to be incorporated into local le legislation, also in order to level the global playing field. And we need to evaluate, last but not least, also what is working. What are the side effects, even if they might be unintended, and what are the implications? So, Matthias, I think I'm afraid um, with our study, we did a first contribution, um, our first output uh, with our analysis, but considering the dynamics um, in this field, I think um, there's certainly work to be done in the near future, and I'm looking forward to have um, another cooperation with you and your team in Geneva. It's always a pleasure to cooperate with IOE. And I thank you very much for this very uh, well-established cooperation. And thanks again to all of you for sharing your time with us and your expertise. And thank you particularly also to Monique, Monique de Pierre. She is a master behind the scene. No one sees her, but everyone knows she is actually who is bringing us together. So thank you, thank you, Monique, for all you're doing here for bringing that together. See you soon. Bye-bye.